uh, I would like to welcome uh, you all in our uh, SSBD uh, COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 pandemic make a great challenge in the management of almost all diseases and specifically in our hematology and oncology patients. Uh, SSBD has the initiative to organize a series of free live webinars uh, to make highlights on the most important uh, management aspects of hematology uh, patients. And uh, this is during this pandemic. We had so far four uh, successful uh, full webinars, uh, three for, uh, for the physician and one for the patients. And uh, it was very well attended. Uh, our two days webinar will highlight on uh, lymphoproliferative uh, disorders uh, management during COVID pandemic. And during this webinars, we'll have uh, over the last, uh, next uh, one and a half hour, we'll have three uh, sessions with uh, very distinguished speakers. Uh, and uh, for your information, uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded fully and will be available in at the SSBD uh, YouTube channel and Twitter. And uh, without any further delay, uh, it uh, gave me a great pleasure to present our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Mushabab Asiri. Dr. Mushabab is a senior consultant, uh, clinical and radiation oncologist at King Fahad Medical City. He is the chief executive officer of Saudi Particle Therapy Center and a general director uh, of Saudi Arabian National uh, Cancer Institute of the Saudi Health Council at the Saudi Health Council. Uh, Dr. Asiri will present to us uh, the Saudi uh, National Cancer uh, Institute uh, uh, Caregiver and Cancer Facility Guidelines during COVID-19. So please. Bismillah uh. ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Amal Bihani and uh, Saudi uh, Society for Blood Disorder for giving me the chance to be here with a lot of uh, friends and colleagues and to talk about uh, the issue that's affecting the life of our patients and, and our lives. Uh, uh, this presentation is on behalf of uh, my colleagues who, who uh, participated in uh, uh, putting down the standards and uh, what we feel is important for uh, the people who is practicing in, in hematology and oncology centers around uh, around the country. So at the beginning of, of the pandemic, uh, we thought in, uh, at the Saudi Arabia National Cancer Institute to come with, with a document that help our colleagues who are practicing in, in the cancer center. And you know, uh, the practice of oncology in Saudi Arabia is, is variable, some, some of it is comprehensive cancer centers, some of it is only uh, department, some of them regional. So we, we, we thought that it is important to come with a common uh, standard and guidelines to help our colleagues in different uh, centers in Saudi Arabia. As, as you may know, that there is uh, around uh, 30 uh, centers in, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, who are uh, uh, practicing oncology and, and, and uh, 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 treating treating patients with, with cancer. So we we, we have a list of, of uh, twelve uh, uh, known oncologists and hematologists in Saudi Arabia: Dr. Arish Giri from King Faisal Chest Hospital, Dr. Abdullah Shurum from King Fahad Medical City, Abdurrahman Jazia from uh, National Guard, Dr. Hamdi Shahrani from Pediatric Hematology and, and Military Hospital, Dr. Balbaid uh, from King Fahad Medical City. Uh, Dr. Hanin Hashmi, uh, who's a hematologist from King Fahad Special Hospital in Dammam. Dr. Khad Saleh from uh, KKUH, Dr. Mat'ab al Fahidi, Dr. Ibrahim al uh, Dr. Hussam al Assaf al Maid al Uthman. All of us, we, we, we thought that it is important to come with uh, uh, unified national guidelines to care for cancer patients during uh, uh, the, uh, the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, before we, 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 we wrote the, the guidelines and pathways, uh, it is very important to, to recognize the great work uh, that published by our colleagues in Saudi Center for Disease 
Prevention and Control, which is the Saudi uh, CDC. Uh, they have uh, worked uh, greatly in, 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 in this field and they published a lot of uh, uh, guidelines and, and, and pathways in, in uh, Arabic and English. And uh, we, we thought that we will be only filling the gap. I think that's not mentioned in uh, CDC guidelines. Uh, uh, we, we, we thought that it is important to, to, pick, uh, to put it in, in the uh, national uh, cancer guidelines. Uh, to support the, the CDC uh, report. And uh, CDC, is, uh, Saudi CDC, they have an excellent relation with the American CDC. And I think they, they will have major role in the uh, practice of, of, of cancer care in, in the future. So uh, the document is available in our website uh, and uh, we, we, we uh, uh, updated uh, last uh, Sunday and it will be updated uh, after uh, uh, about six days, uh, we will have uh, the third uh, edition of, of the guidelines, so it's available, and I'll go through it quickly. Uh, first, we, we thought it's important for all cancer centers and, uh, and cancer caregiver to educate the staff. Educating the staff, is not, the staff is not only the physician, the nurses, the allied health, the anesthetist, the radiologist, the pathologist, about the, the disease. So it is important at the beginning of, of the pandemic to educate everybody about it. Uh, and to establish uh, hospital-based screening procedures uh, in all uh, uh, hospitals, uh, to implement international standard precaution, and to make sure that uh, PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, is available with enough quantity, uh, and to, to encourage, we actually we encourage everybody to, to, to use a surgical mask at the, at the clinical areas, uh, whether they are patient or the staff. Uh, this is, we, we recommend that from from uh, March, and uh, till now there is no strong evidence, uh, but I think it is uh, excellent practice uh, for people who is uh, suffering from cancer or people who is uh, a cancer caregiver. Uh, also, anybody who is working in cancer center, they should have a N95 fitting test uh, for all medical staff, and if they have a problem with that, like they have beard or, or they have uh, problem that's uh, stopping them from using an N95, they have to come with uh, other alternative which is available uh, based on the hospital uh, internal policy and procedure. And it's also it's important to assign a staff to, to, to do uh, the swab for uh, COVID-19. And uh, it is important also to identify call center for the patient because uh, we expected to, to, to receive a lot of uh, phone calls, especially that the cancer center, they are in the in the major city and a lot of patients, they have to travel between the cities, uh, they, they need uh, permission. So each cancer center, they should assign a staff or department or people or a group of people, uh, depend on, on the size of the cancer center to help the patient and to give them support during this difficult time. Uh, in addition to that, we, we, we recommend uh, certain preparation for, for the cancer center. Uh, and the most important things is to limit access to one point of entry. Anybody who will come to the cancer center, whether he or she is a staff or patient, you should come from uh, one point of entry because there will be screening, there will be a restriction, there will be a, a history of truffle or history of, of flu-like symptom. And also the temperature should be uh, measured every day uh, before the staff or the visitor or the patient coming inside uh, the cancer care unit. Uh, cancer patients, they are vulnerable and they are at high risk, their immunity is, is impaired. And so we have to protect them uh, from any uh, uh, possibility of, of risk that may happen during the visitor entry. So uh, the, the most important part is to restrict access to cancer care unit to one point of entry where you can uh, provide screening, education, uh, measuring temperature, uh, and uh, also to protect uh, uh, the facility from uh, unknown people to, to come inside. Uh, and to do that also, we have to provide uh, virtual support services, uh, as telemedicine clinic, uh, virtual, uh, support uh, from application uh, and also it is important to establish triage center uh, at the entry of, of any cancer care unit 
at the entry of uh, chemotherapy bay, uh, or infusion bay, at the uh, entrance of radiotherapy uh, areas, at the entrance of uh, inpatient uh, services. So all these areas has to be uh, uh, protected, should be triaged, and also availability of uh, sterilization uh, materials and alcohol and, and so on. Uh, it is important to keep 150 centimeter apart distance at all the entry point, at the front desk, waiting areas, infusion bay, uh, also during the ward round, the physician, uh, the nurses, the allied health, uh, the cleaners, everybody should keep the distance of one and a half meter. Uh, also, when we uh, uh, meeting patient, we try to uh, we we we, we uh, ask the practitioner to avoid uh, medical and, and physical examination as possible, and to keep the distance uh, while they are wearing the protective uh, equipment. Uh, also, we, we we recommend to suspend all on-site uh, meetings, including the tumor board, and to replace. So uh, any kind of, of, of meeting should be suspended and replaced by virtual meetings uh, or any other modality for, 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 for meetings. Uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the pandemic, there, will be, there was a problem with the patient appointment, uh, which patients should come to the hospital. As you know, that they, they are at risk. And we try to limit the access to the hospital for, for the patient who really need to come to the hospital. So we decided to postpone all routine follow-up, all the cancer survivors, they should not come to the hospital. They, sh they can stay at home, and the hospital should provide them with the support. Uh, there should be refill uh, services for medication, including the narcotics, and there should be an arrangement to, uh, for delivery of, of medication uh, by uh, postal services. And that, uh, alhamdulillah, was, was, was successful. Uh, most of the cancer center in, in, in the country doing that, uh, and I'm sure it helped. Uh, to support the patient during this and to uh, keep the patient who do, do not need to come to the hospital at home, uh, keep them away from the risk from coming and mixing with, with, with the hospital. And to adapt telemedicine uh, 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 processes. Uh, problem with the telemedicine that uh, staff, they are not familiar with documentation of telephonic call uh, or Zoom meeting. So we, 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 we educated, we, we recommend to educate the staff how to document uh, telephonic uh, uh, conversation with the patient, to put it in the patient chart or, or medical record, uh, and to document if the patient did not uh, came or did not show up, uh, and to document that uh, appointment was given and, the, and, the, and medication was prescribed. Uh, and also, uh, all cancer centers, they, they should arrange uh, for the patient who come to the hospital, especially in the waiting area, to avoid to, to avoid uh, crowd and, and, and mixing. Prevention is, is about education and isolation. If we educate everybody, including the patient, their their supporter, their family about uh, uh, the, the the corona or SARS-2 virus, uh, and to isolate them, isolation uh, either uh, to protect them and limit the access. Uh, asking them to wear mask uh, to keep away from uh, people who have uh, fever or, or flu-like symptom uh, and to stay at home as much as possible. Uh, and one of, one, one of the most important uh, prevention method is one point entry for, for the cancer care unit. Uh, and also to, to utilize the signage, uh, visualization of symptom uh, and to use all modality and all medias uh, devices to, to educate uh, the patient and their family about the proper hygiene, uh, especially hand hygiene uh, and prevention of symptom and to stay at home, avoid going to the uh, uh, areas where there is, where is a crowd. Uh, we decide uh, to recommend to deny a visitor uh, from coming to the cancer care unit, especially to the chemotherapy bay unit. Uh, or chemotherapy infusion bay uh, and uh, radiotherapy uh, uh, centers at the same time for uh, transplant unit. 
uh, I think it's important. Uh, it will create problem with, with the visitors, but it has to be implemented strictly to stop visitors from coming to, the, to their place and to replace that with uh, available uh, uh, ways of, of communication uh, like virtual meeting or, or uh, video uh, calls uh, uh, so the patient can say, see and communicate with their relative without a physical contact. Uh, the same thing that we deny watchers uh, uh, unless the watcher will stay uh, 24 hours in the same room with the patient. That's that's a little bit apply for the children that the watcher should not leave the hospital at any time. They should stay in the hospital. And uh, uh, this was a little bit faced with, with, with unhappiness from uh, the patient, but we have to uh, to, to protect the, the cancer center from uh, unknown people who's going in and out. Uh, and again, uh, everybody who's coming to the hospital in the morning uh, should be screened and triaged outside the, the care unit. Uh, and we instruct the patient if they have any symptom to, to call uh, before they come to the hospital uh, and, and to have uh, contact uh, for, for the patient by, by the coordinators. Uh, if the patient came uh, to, the, to the cancer center, uh, the care unit, and they have a uh, suspicion of infection, uh, we uh, 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 recommend for the cancer centers uh, to identify an exam room uh, to be used as uh, as an, as COVID patient uh, exam room. That uh, that room should be uh, isolated. Uh, if we suspect patient with with symptom, that you have to provide them with with the mask, uh, and you have to ask the the, the staff in, in your area to uh, to wear their PPE complete complete PPE, which is additional to the face mask, uh, and uh, to adhere to the standard precaution. Uh, and to use a 95 respirator uh, if there is high high suspicion of, of, of infection. I think also the ER, uh, the, the, the are uh, uh, strict in, 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 uh, in this. And to also each cancer center, they should have plan of management for suspected uh, suspected patients. Uh, we, we, we publish on, on the guidelines the scenarios uh, for the uh, cancer care uh, provider uh to 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 see if the if the met patient why they are not on full ppe for example if, if the uh, physician or nurse of the allied health uh, exposed to the COVID patient while he is only on the face mask or and he has he has not have an apron or he have the goggles uh, so there is a, a, a scenario for each possibility uh, and it is mainly not to uh, making the, the, the practitioner as a fecal for infection to others. So if, if, the, if the practitioner exposed to the patient, they have to quarantine and swab uh, before they are allowed to see uh, uh, other staff. Uh, for, for, for general management of, of patients with, with, with uh, uh, COVID-19 and, 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 uh, 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 and cancer, uh, we, we uh, divided the group to two, two groups patients without COVID-19, and they have to be uh, discuss their, their management with their uh, consultant. And to prioritize depends on the outcome and, and depends on the aim, the goal of, of management. And uh, there is a, a priority model by, by King Face Space Hospital where they, they publish their, uh, or we adopt their priority model uh, in, in, in uh, three, treating uh, uh, hematological malignancy. Uh, they, they have uh, limited the admission for life threatening uh, in most of the diagnosis, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they have excellent document. It is, it is linked to, to the, our guidelines uh, about treating MDS, AML, and also uh, lymphoma with their uh, different uh, categories. And also, they, they touch base on the uh, transplant and also in, in, in blood disorders. I, I encourage. Uh, each hospital either to adopt uh, 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 adopt uh, something like this or to come with their own uh, uh, th their own uh, guidelines. Um, I just like to come out of this. Sorry. 
for, for the patient to have uh, uh, for, for for the patient to have uh, diagnosis with, with COVID-19, we, we we recommend them to uh, uh, sorry, uh, we, we recommend them to uh, stop treatment uh, till uh, the uh, 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 Till they get cured from COVID-19. So any patient with with cancer and COVID-19 uh, together, the double challenge, uh, we recommend to stop an, any anti-cancer treatment uh, while the patient diagnosed with COVID-19 and to delay the management till they recover from uh, from the, their disease, uh, either by two swabs uh, or to be uh, 14 days uh, free for, while they are free of of, of uh, symptom. Uh, it is important to assign uh, a team uh, of physician, nurses, and allied health uh, to care for patients with cancer and COVID-19. And this team should not uh, mix with, with, with uh, uh, other teams uh, in the ER or in the local area or in the meetings. And this team should, once they finish their, their duties uh, to care for the COVID-19 and cancer patients, they have to go home. Uh, and to come back to the work after uh, the 14 days. Uh, this is uh, especially difficult, very difficult for, with, with uh, human uh, resources, but I think it's important to stop, uh, to stop infection uh, and to protect other cancer patients uh, from getting the disease. Again, educate and isolate and support the patient. This is the main uh, uh, things that we have to concentrate all of us. And for any more information about the guidelines, it's available on the so the Health Council website, and we are publishing it every uh, two weeks. Uh, any one of the uh, colleagues in hematology like to add uh, to the guidelines, please uh, communicate with me, and we'll be happy to add his name to the uh, others and to uh, adopt any recommendation, keeping our patient uh, safe from uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Asiri. And uh, we'll keep uh, the question to the end of the sessions. Uh, so please submit your question at the Q&A section, and we'll answer of all of them at the end uh, of the webinar. Uh, and if you allow me to present the uh, next speaker is Dr. Dr. Riyad Dada. Uh, Dr. Riyad is a senior consultant hematology and medical oncology at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Jeddah. And he's the director of lymphoma unit at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Uh, Dr. Riyad will talk about uh, lymphoma management in the context of uh, COVID-19. So please, uh, Dr. Riyad. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amal, and thank you, Dr. Faraz, for the invitation and the nice organization. Um, um, I would like to share with you some uh, information around the management of, of lymphoma during the outbreak of COVID-19 in the next a uh, few uh, minutes. Uh, let me uh, put the laser pointer first. Okay, uh, I will speak about um, the uh, different types of the lymphoma, including Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, non Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, and differentiate here maybe if there is a time between uh, endolymphoma and aggressive lymphoma and T lymphoma and T cell lymphoma. Um, as you know, March, uh, 11th March uh, 2020, the WHO organization has declared the pandemic outbreak of COVID-19. And uh, because this is uh, something which is new for our generation, uh, we haven't been faced with any uh, pandemic like this uh, in our life. Uh, this is, uh, overwhelming for many sectors, not only in the industry and uh, uh, in the economy and uh, in other branches, also the healthcare system, the medical uh, uh, system and the clinical, the, there is uh, some unmet needs and some uh, uh, things that, that need to be fixed. Um, we haven't uh, seen any uh, uh, clear guidelines until now, which have been published in, in uh, respective journal. Therefore, you will not see during my uh, speak uh, uh, any uh, um, journal uh, publication which I uh, can uh, um, present. I have collected some data from um, uh, some societies 
like the Ash and the Esco, uh, the ISMO, uh, the uh, German and British uh, uh, societies for hematology and oncology. Um, as you know, um, um, hematological malignancies and people with hematological malignancies they have uh, um, also their immune system is affected by disease itself, and therefore they are immune compromised in comparison with, with other patients. If you look to the data from China, from Italy, 20% of patients' deaths related to COVID-19, they were patients with cancer. And among these patients, especially patients with hematological malignancies like leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, et cetera, there were more patients in uh, this outbreak. Uh, not only because of that, patients that are receiving came with therapy and all of also the therapy, which is, of course, more convenient and uh, has a more uh, favorable uh, side effect in comparison with came with, they can also do um, separation. And all, therefore, we have to, to deal with these patients. Uh, really very, very cautious in the area. Uh, additionally, patients with uh, uh, complete the chemotherapy, they are more compromised, compromise, as you know, and some of the others, they, they, these patients are beyond one year, uh, up to two years, they are uh, at highest to get infected with, um, with uh, any uh, to get certain complications, if they catch uh, COVID-19. As you know, uh, bendocin can cause a prolonged uh, lymphocytopenia which can uh, take up to years till the patient recovers from that. In order to um, make it uh, uh, in a better way how we can understand that I divided the lymphoma in different, in different uh, uh, categories. Uh, the newly diagnosed patients, we have to distinguish between slow dynamic uh, um, uh, tumor or uh, uh, dynamic tumor, um, and uh, this will be just in the, uh, the next uh, slides. Um, and uh, we have also a deal with not only patients but also with patients who are running treatment. What do we do with them? Is the patient, their treatment relative? Is it corrective? Uh, is their disease with the current treatment of current cycle numbers will controlled or not will controlled? Um, coming to the uh, um, patient with a newly diagnosed lymphoma, um, is the treatment indicated or is it indicated like in, 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 in some patients with, uh, with indolent lymphoma? have also asked ourselves, the patient is not indicated, do I uh, expect a physician? I mean, uh, uh, all of us are, uh, we have, a, we are having uh, experience, is uh, this patient expected to uh, get troubles in the next few months, as of less than one year? If yes, I have to close, close if up the patient. Telemedicine is, as the Mushabab mentioned already, and most of our practice already, telemedicine is an attractive approach. Uh, but also for patients where I have the feeling that this patient is not expected to uh, um, progress within uh, uh, the next uh, year, um, I may defer the follow-up appointment, as you know, Many of us, we, we are following the patients every three to four months. I might extend this uh, follow up uh, uh, interim. A treatment indicated, we have to differentiate again between uh, a not urgent treatment or urgent treatment. This will be uh, seen also by the end of my presentations. Um, all of us, we are using phone call telemedicine visits, very important. Uh, and I think um, uh, one of the initiatives what uh, several hospitals have started to do and we also planning this is to educate the patients on the, uh, uh, not only in phone calls, but also uh, um, educational sessions like this one webinar uh, about the symptoms and uh, how to prevent 
the, the infection of COVID, uh, with, with coronavirus. Um, we have uh, always, every day, we have to um, balance and to weigh uh, whether to start the treatment for the patients or to delay the treatment uh, and to weigh the risk of progression, risk of, uh, uh, on the side of the patient, the risk on the side of disease, the risk on the side of, of, of the treatment we are going to apply to the patients. Um, and uh, with regard to, uh, Dr. Mushabab alluded to that in his talk, with, uh, with regard to uh, how we list our patients by starting anti-cancer treatment, there is no clear guide, uh, guidelines until now. I uh, joined uh, several webinars in the last few weeks. And I heard several opinions from several colleagues how they are handling their patients. Some of them they are uh, scanning or testing all patients prior anti, uh, any anti neuroleptic treatment. Some are uh, uh, testing only those patients who are going for a more intensive chemotherapy like uh, leukemia treatment or transplantations. And some of, uh, of us, they are treating uh, those patients who are having symptoms of cough and fever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, uh, I looked in the uh, 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 literature where we can find a specific recommendation published in PubMed or any respected journal uh, uh, for lymphoma, and I couldn't find it. I find only found only uh, ASH recommendation, ISMO recommendation, and German and British recommendation, as I mentioned earlier. And we'll go to, the, to the, these very quickly, uh, one by one. We'll start with lymphoma. If you have a patient with risk lymphoma, of course, there is a high priority to treat this patient because this is a potential curative treatment. Uh, but what I have to uh, uh, take in consideration is do the least most aggressive therapy uh, uh, to the patients. Uh, what does it mean? It means for those who are using B uh, B and these are not only the Germans and the British who are using a uh, uh, BCOP. There are some collegiate cases who are also using BCOP. I would uh, uh, stop uh, using BCOP in the, uh, during the break of uh, um, COVID-19 and use instead EVD. Um, uh, I would intensive, intensify the use of pet guided uh, strategy as brothel trials, where we uh, uh, from a uh, scan uh, uh, early, and uh, if patients reach uh, metabolic complete remission, to omit bleomycin, omit uh, bleomycin because bleomycin can cause lung toxicity, and as you know, COVID 19 is a disease affecting uh, the lung. Additionally, in advanced stages, um, we have a view data with regard to print to uh, to replace the bleomycin. Uh, I will also uh, use more in advanced stages uh, print to instead uh, of uh, bleomycin. Um, patients with no uh, priority with Hodgkin's coma, these patients who are having relapse. Uh, a relapse disease, as example here, uh, and requiring uh, uh, treatment, I would maybe rather use uh, palliative radiation. We have here to discuss between palliative radiation and curative radiation. Many authors are recommending in the era of COVID-19 to use chemotherapy, as of those who are using an early age disease, maybe say it later on, so uh, to use chemotherapy as a complete with six cycles rather than giving uh, uh, less cycles and consolidate with radiation because the curative treatment is associated with many visits to the hospitals which put the patient at the risk of being infected. Palliative radiation is just few seconds and the patient will be finished. Um, uh, additionally, uh, uh, patients uh, are autologous transplantation with high risk used to give patients rituximab maintenance. I would think very carefully prior starting rituximab uh, maintenance the era of COVID-19 uh, prior starting uh, rituximab. Uh, we think we'll 
on starting palliative chemotherapy uh, relapse uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin lymphoma is, uh, as you know, is not known to be a highly proliferative disease. is usually a small tumors. On any occasion, you can defer and delay the palliative chemotherapy. Sorry for this very busy uh, slide, but we will not go through uh, all uh, aspects of these slides. We have just to focus on the questions and the answers of these questions in uh, blue. Are you changing therapies for patients who have already started treatment? This question might appear. No, use GSSF and telemedicine. This is the answer. Are you changing your approach to initial therapy? In general, no. With some modification, some out and improved modification, as I mentioned earlier, maybe more uh, chemo rather uh, radiation uh, uh, and use uh, the use of uh, Briximab, Vidorin. Um, uh, for early stage, uh, unfavorable disease and advanced stage, as mentioned, I will use uh, Brintuximab instead of uh, bleomycin. And what about the supportive uh, treatment? I will give uh, GSF prophylaxis and antibiotics for patients who are expected to be neutropenic or patients who uh, uh, who uh, has, have already uh, neutropenia. Maybe I can mention something which I have changed uh, as well during the COVID-19 outbreak. I used to give all patients these uh, uh, continued uh, subsequent cycles uh, uh, with PVD, uh, regardless the neutrophils, whether they have uh, 0.5 or 1 or 0.3, I continue usually treatment uh, with the support of GSF and antibiotics. But now, in the, in the, in the uh, outbreak of uh, COVID-19, I am hesitating to uh, continue with this approach. This may be one of the challenges or one of the changes uh, that I have made. But the first line is lymphoma. Uh, it's high priority, as you know. It's, it's, it's high blood of disease usually, and you are treating your patients with the potential to be cured, and therefore, uh, uh, the, these patients should uh, receive their treatment with the support uh, of Jesus and me at maybe antibiotics. I will use uh, uh, 21 rather than SHOP14 or more intensive therapy. As you know, there are some colleagues who are treating uh, patients uh, EPC as activated uh, uh, subtype of uh, 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 diffuse large vessel lymphoma with more intensive chemotherapy of patients uh, with a double head, trouble head, uh, triple head with more intensive chemotherapy. We have to think it's really uh, very, very well in the era of COVID 19 prior starting uh, of these treatments uh, because conflicting the and the literature. Patients, uh, older patients, I would use rather uh, our new shop. Uh, what about CNS prophylaxis? Uh, there are uh, conflicting data with regard to CNS prophylaxis in different settings, high IPI, uh, paraspinal mass, uh, nasopharyngeal involvement, and etc. etc. I will be really strict in indication, very, very, very uh, tight, and treat only those patients who really in need of testes, breast, uh, kidney, and so on. Uh, uh, involvement and maybe I will limit it to two cycles. There is no agreement around the, the cycle number for CNS prophylaxis. Plus, I uh, am giving four cycles. We could have uh, given the era of COVID 19 only two cycles, and there is no uh, clear guidance when to give it first cycle or uh, second cycle, third cycle. I will defer it uh, to uh, later uh, cycles. Uh, we know the flyer trials. Uh, the trial is uh, showing that uh, patients with uh, limited stage uh, adjusted IPI uh, zero score with no bulky disease, these patients, they are very well served with four cycles are stop. The ASH is recommending to use rituximab stop instead of IV to reduce the duration of the hospital. Um, uh, with regard to high dose chemotherapy and transplantation, I will mention this and exercise later on. 
card therapy, there is a new uh, paper, uh, uh, card therapy in, in multiple malignancies. How to is the, the recommending to oh, yeah. go ahead. Two minutes more. Okay. Uh, to go ahead with uh, the treatment. Um, uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, medium priority patients who are relapsing, uh, maybe don't use bendamustin, uh, seeing it's perhaps similar as, as I said, uh, the question that may appear, are you changing therapies for patients who have started treatment? No. Uh, are you change therapy to minimize visits? Telemedicine is very important. I might by you uh, relapse patient oral treatment. I change the uh, treatment recommendation for refractory patients. Uh, most experts they are continuing to offer second line chemotherapy and continue with the transplantation. But we we can differ from the transplantation later on if the patient another stage of treatment. Uh, what about for local lymphoma? For local lymphoma, I recommend to use RCVP rather than RSHOP. If you want to use RSHOP and Vindamustin, use RSHOP because Vindamustin can cause a lymphocytopenia, as will the neutropenia rate, as you know from breast trials and other trials. Uh, um, uh, RSHOP has more neutropenia, but lymphocytopenia is clearly more uh, the side of the mustin. Maybe R2, or R squared, sorry, instead of chemotherapy as a revlimit can be used. Um, um, Ritzimab, seeing agent in pain who doesn't have uh, a high volume disease, maybe an attractive option. Mantle cell lymphoma, several to local lymphoma. Uh, are you changing your location for therapy? Yes, use option eight whenever possible. Are you changing your approach to initial therapy? Yes, the agent rituximab is given priority, and maybe you can use protein uh, in mantle cell lymphoma patients. Uh, T cell lymphoma is similar to uh, um, uh, endolith lymphoma, with the uh, exception that I might use uh, brentuximab in more patients instead of chemotherapy. What about high dose chemotherapy and uh, transplantation? High dose chemotherapy in mantle cell lymphoma, they are data recommending this, but I will be very cautious personally, I will not use it. Uh, until this period code 19 is over. T cell lymphoma data is in, 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 in uh, CD30 positive uh, in uh, health positive patients uh, upfront. I'm speaking of, uh, about upfront uh, autologous cell transplantation. I will differ it for later on. For relapse patients, of course, the indications there, I, I might bridge uh, uh, the, the time with another cycle if the patient is in control the patient is responding. Uh, I will go through uh, all these slides. And uh, these are uh, for the last slide. Uh, we went through this. And let me share with you this the treatment indication. If the treatment is indicated, uh, the treatment is urgent for lymphoma patient. Close up is recommended. Uh, if the treatment is urgently indicated, we have a discussion between low risk of immune suppression chemotherapy like uh, rituximab, uh, single agent, you can start it uh, immediately. Um, as a highly, uh, this is originally indicated treatment, not the patients. A patient uh, where you expect treatment can cause uh, a high risk of immune suppression. Is it palliative? Is it curative? For palliative, of course, maximum support. For curative, also go ahead with maximum support. And this is the last slide. That's what I designed actually for our section of our department in the era of COVID-19. This is a scoring system, what we are going now through validation is, which is taking into consideration the uh, factors in the side of the tumor. It's the positive uh, um, uh, risk for progression, risk for relapse, then the treatment-related issue, uh, uh, will the treatment of the overall survival or progression-free survival and to which degree uh, and which type of immunization has uh, causes or factors uh, related to COVID-19, uh, factors which is related to, uh, on the P side and the hospital side. And the score has the maximum of 74 uh, and patients who have 54 C who will go for treatment less than 74 up to minus 
not 50. That I would have to think. Thank you, Dr. Dada, for this uh, comprehensive review. Again, I would uh, request everybody to submit the question to, uh, to the Q&A section, and we'll answer the question at the end of the webinar. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Dada. So we'll come to our next speaker. Uh, is, uh, next speaker is Professor uh, Evelgust uh, Tervos. Uh, he's a professor of hematology and the director of stem cell transplantation unit and plasma cell dyscaresis uh, at the Department of Clinical Therapeutic at Alexander General Hospital, University of Athens and Greece, at Greece. Uh, Professor uh, Trepos will uh, speak about multiple myeloma management during COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, please, thank Professor. you so much, uh, Dr. Albehani, and thank you for the kind invitation to talk about this uh, important issue. I'm going to find it interesting as I have included um, several novel data, even uh, regarding myeloma. Uh, I don't know if you see my, my slides. Is it okay? All right. These are my disclosures. Uh, so probably you are the first audience who see the new ESMO guidelines that are in preparation. The manuscript has been uh, just uh, uh, prepared, so I want to share with you uh, something that, of course, we all, you all use in Saudi Arabia uh, as you uh, treat uh, patients with novel drugs uh, from the beginning. And uh, for those patients who are eligible for transplant, uh, the new standards of care are the VRD, as we know, and the Daratumab in combination with VTD based on the Cassiopeia study. The other options uh, seems to be of uh, lower uh, recommendation, followed, of course, by autologous transplant and lenalidomide maintenance. Uh, interestingly, the inclusion of daratumab in the first line for those who are not eligible for transplant, uh, like uh, Dara VMP and Dara RD, also with the triplet VRD, seems to be the first option for the newly diagnosed, non eligible for transplant patients. But as you understand, if we go on Dara first line, then what's going to happen in the uh, relapsed refractory setting, it is uh, very, very challenging. So the, I know that this is extremely uh, complicated and busy, but it's the only way to try to find a way uh, for those patients, for example, who receive daratumab in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone as first-line therapy in elderly patient. So if someone continues on Dara and Len, and then the patient progress on that, so the patient is LEN refractory, for example, or DARA refractory, then we don't have any evidence in the, uh, in the literature of what would be the next step. Probably the combination of pomalidomide, belcade, and dexamethasone can give some solution, or the combination of venetoclax with uh, uh, bortezomib and, DARA and uh, dexamethasone for those. But you understand that this is extremely difficult because even the pomalidomide, Belkate, and dexamethasone, the Optimist study, had included no patient who had been exposed previously to daratumumab. So you understand that uh, the daratumumab uh, first-line uh, treatment makes very difficult to go for the second or third line. So in all these difficulties that we have in the treatment of myeloma, we have now also the difficulty of the COVID-19 infection. This is another busy slide. I don't want to talk a lot about the pathogenesis, but I just only want to mention that the respiratory tract is the major um, uh, organ damage uh, from COVID-19 and then the inflammatory process in this uh, specific uh, area, and mainly in the lungs, creates the whole catastrophic syndrome that uh, creates ARDS and then the need for incubation, intubation, and um, the need uh, for ICU, unfortunately, 40 to 50 percent of the patients in ICU would not manage to recover. It is um, uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, infection disease 19 is an important uh, virus for hematology because it creates a lot of hematologic uh, findings and complications. So we have summarized that in that paper that I think that it is very didactic. So you have the time to go. Uh, it is in PubMed now and. Uh, it was uh, uh, just appeared on the 13th of April, so it's only one week before. So we have put all the publications together in this uh, paper, 
saying that uh, the most important uh, hematological finding is the lymphopenia, which is a cardinal laboratory finding with prognostic potential. Also, prognostic value in several series is the uh, uh, ratio of neutrophile to lymphocyte and the peak platelet to lymphocyte ratio. Uh, during the course of the disease, we have uh, longitudinal evaluation of lymphocyte count dynamics and uh, the inflammatory uh, cytokines, including LDH, CRP, and TGPT6. Uh, biomarkers such as high serum procalcitonin and ferritin have also emerged as poor prognostic factors because, uh, of course, it shows to us the level of inflammation. But the most important is that uh, this is a virus that uh, creates a lot of thrombotic events. So the disseminated intravascular coagulation and the elevated D-dimers are very, very common in patients with uh, COVID. More than 20% of the patients in our hands had these problems. And for this reason, at least uh, patients who are uh, hospitalized in the intensive care units have to have a pharmacological thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. This is highly recommended. And we have just um, uh, created a score uh, in order to, to, to manage to find out uh, based on this uh, hematological findings and we have uh, we are going to submit it for publication but in order to go to the main uh, topic of uh, my uh, talk my presentation which is how we can uh, manage the myeloma patients during the COVID-19 pandemic is we have first of all general recommendation like um, uh, as we know the patients with multiple myeloma are very vulnerable uh, to infections so this creates a lot of problems we need, of course, to have the standard prevention of infection, including uh, the social uh, distancing, cleaning surface, washing of heads frequently, avoiding traveling, and limiting contacts, as in all other diseases. The therapeutic decisions should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. And as a major, uh, major advice is to contact telemedicine whenever it's possible with your patients and prescribe oral drugs as much as possible, like immunomodulatory drugs and oral progesterone inhibitors. And if the intravenous drugs are used, consider using at a reduced frequency. These are general recommendations. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a question in the ASA recommendation resources, and you can see uh, the reference that you can find all this information. Uh, so, are you changing therapy to minimize visits, for example, changing to oral and less frequent regimens? How frequently are you giving the zoledronic acid infusions? So, I think that whenever possible, it is recommended to use weekly and oral regimen. That is a standard recommendation. Patients on three drug, drug regimens can be continued with doublet oral regimens during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in those with stable disease and with standard research genetics. Outpatient visits. For treatment are restricted to patients who benefits for the multi-drug non-oral regimens are expected to outweigh the risks. And regarding bisphosphonates, I think that uh, main zoledronic acid that remains into the hydroxyapatite for years, it can be easily given uh, every three months after the first uh, response of the patient. Uh, remote uh, laboratories, telemedicine, and prescription delivery via mail should be used to decrease the clinic visits, which is a standard approach. Regarding patients uh, who are uh, uh, eligible for transplant, uh, regarding their frontline therapy, I think that uh, the autologous transplants should be postponed if possible. And this is what we are doing in our uh, department uh, for the standard risk patients. Uh, for the high risk patients, I, we continue to have uh, the autologous transplant, but for all these patients, we tested before for COVID-19. Uh, induction regimen before the transplant can include up to six cycles. For the standard risk that we don't want to transplant them, uh, we uh, delay the transplant by additional induction cycles uh, and or lenalidomide maintenance without transplant. If the patients are at active and high risk disease, the treatment should not be postponed. And this is what we are doing for the high risk disease. We are performing the autonomous transplant and we test our uh, patients before for COVID-19 presence. Regarding uh, the induction, six to eight cycles of uh, VRD, followed by lenalidomide maintenance is the recommended approach. Uh, delayed transplant, as I previously mentioned, in the pandemic uh, uh, 
abates. This is recommended. These are the as resources. In such cases, continued BRD induction for six and up to eight sites can be considered, as you can see, they are similar to the International uh, Myeloma Society uh, recommendation. Uh, patients who are already in the process of stem cell collection can proceed with stem cell collection, but the transplant itself should be delayed, as I previously mentioned. Regarding maintenance, I think that because we have an oral drug for maintenance, which is lenalidomide, then I think that uh, uh, lenalidomide can easily be given and then the patient can be checked every two months instead of monthly. And if we can uh, use telemedicine on that and if we can have in-home blood draws, then that would be uh, very good. Of course, for high-risk patients where lenalidomide, we do know that is not enough, then we recommend the continuation of treatment with Velcade and lenalidomide maintenance. Uh, of course, this can be changed to lenalidomide alone uh, the patient responds well, but for the high risk, I believe that I would go for Velcade and lenalidomide. But as you know, as in Saudi Arabia, you may use even Ixazomib, then you can change Velcade to Ixazomib in order to avoid the hospital uh, visit. If a patient gets COVID, then it is prudent to interrupt maintenance until infection resolution, and this is the standard for every antimyeloma therapy if the patient has the COVID. 19 infection. Regarding elderly patients with newly diagnosed myeloma, the International Myeloma Society suggests that uh, we have to prescribe treatment based on oral administration, mainly lenalidomide and uh, dexamethasone, uh, with internal phone calls to monitor tolerability and outcome. Uh, dexamethasone should be reduced to half the dose, so it is 20 mg weekly, or for the very elderly, 10 mg weekly. And if we have good response to frontline lenalidomide and dexamethasone, don't forget that uh, uh, we have the uh, Italian study which showed that uh, we, can we can discontinue dexamethasone after the first nine cycles of Lendex. But here in the COVID situation, you can even uh, re stop the uh, dexamethasone earlier than the nine months. So after four or six months, you have a very good response. Uh, the American Society of Hematology suggests uh, that um, BRD or DARA-RD can be started uh, depending on the high risk cytogenetic and for all other patients, uh, then Lentex seems to be the preferred option. So in general, if we put all these uh, guidelines together, I would say for standard risk uh, myeloma patients, then alidomide and dexamethasone is the standard uh, during this period of time. For the high-risk disease, I would prefer VRD over DARRD as we don't have any data on uh, the effect of daratumumab in uh, uh, the COVID infection vulnerability. Regarding relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, we have similar recommendations to that given in the upfront setting for the International Myeloma Society. So in case of good response to a free drug intravenous regimen, have to modify treatment to minimize need for clinic and hospital uh, visit by using weekly instead of bi-weekly regimen. Uh, so uh, carfilzomib and bortezomib can be given weekly. We can use oral drugs like exazomib if possible and daratumumab has to be switched to monthly uh, as soon as possible. You understand that all these are expert opinion of the different societies and has nothing to do uh, with true evidence, so we don't have any evidence for patients uh, uh, under daratuma treatment and their behavior uh, if they have a COVID infection. But in order to be safe because of the lymphopenia that daratuma may uh, create, so it's better to go to monthly administration. Uh, the, in the relapsed refractory setting, the uh, use of uh, uh, Ixazomib seems to be very safe in the real world data. And these are some of um, uh, one of the studies that uh, comes from the Greek Czech and the UK database that has just been published in press in hours of hematology. Just to mention that what you expect in the real world with IRD is uh, exactly what you have seen in the New England Journal of Medicine paper for Tourmaline. So we had 155 patients, and you can see that the median PFS is 27.6 months. But more importantly, you see the PFS curve of uh, uh, our real world population compared to the Tourmaline study. You can see that they are totally comparable. We were able to do that because um, the median follow-up period was 15.9 months 
totally uh, equal to the median follow-up of the Tourmaline study. And this uh, uh, curve was created by the statistic uh, team of the Tourmaline. Uh, so you can see that it is totally comparable with um, the uh, blue curve. You can see our population, the name patient program, real world population, and with uh, the red curve, you can see the Tourmaline uh, IRD arm, so you can see that it is totally comparable. Another very interesting study showing that in the real world, you can expect with IRD very good results, so you have not to, um, to afraid of a lower uh, efficacy, is um, this study, which comes from the United, uh, from the United States, uh, comparing VRT, KRD, and IRD. And you can see here that in the real world, uh, the median time to next treatment is better with IRD compared to KRD, it is similar to VRT. And this is mainly because uh, the patient managed to tolerate better. Uh, if you can see, of course, uh, the difference between frail and fit patients, uh, you can see that in the fit patients, the KRD is doing much better, as you can see here, compared to VRD and KRD. But if we go to the intermediate or frail patient, which is the majority, mainly the relapse refractory setting, you can see that the KRD is doing worse compared to the two others. So I think that uh, you understand better uh, that if you have a fit patient, then KRD uh, produces better results, but this is much lower or worse than IRD or VRD in the intermediate and frail uh, population. And I believe that uh, these two curves are totally characteristics of the side effect of carfilzomib and ixazomib. Uh, this uh, also showed us very nicely that comparing IRD with uh, VRD, then you can see that uh, the IRD uh, is better compared to high-risk cytogenetics and prior IMID exposure compared to VRD. So it's a very, very good drug for high-risk and previous uh, IMID exposure like thalidomide. Or uh, if you compare IRD with KRD, then the prior IMID exposure is better for IRD while for all other uh, uh, comparisons, KRD was uh, superior. Regarding clinical trials, the International Myeloma Society suggests that we have to follow the recommendations of the authorities in this country. However, I believe that the inclusion of new patients in clinical trials should be carefully evaluated to consider the benefits and the risk. The patients already participated in the study should be continued and the options to reduce clinical visits through telemedicine, avoiding visits only for the purpose of correlative studies unless required for safety assessment, and when possible, shipping oral investigation drugs to the patient. Consider alternative bridging therapies until the COVID-19 situation improves. Regarding the American Society of Hematology, we have uh, more data here. Uh, as the cellular therapy uh, trials, the majority of them are on hold, and this is the recommendation of the American Society of Hematology. The exception would be some clinical trials that are testing drugs which have shown early clinical activity in myeloma for patients with no other therapeutic alternatives. All these patients would be screened for uh, the COVID-19 infections of the SARS-CoV-2, which is the official name of this coronavirus, before receiving the investigational drug. Alternative patients with heavily treated disease who cannot be enrolled in clinical trials can be considered for novel drugs with compassion use programs if available, and the investigators should work with the IRB companies and agencies to get waivers to minimize visits for patients on clinical trials. There are some nice questions that I found from the ASCO this time uh, website. Is there any value in providing prophylactic antiviral therapy to a wider population of immune suppressed patients that we routinely do? And if so, in which population and what agent can be used. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, there is no evidence or published guidance on the use of prophylactic antiviral therapy for COVID-19 in immunosuppressed patients like the myeloma patients. This is an active area of research and evidence may be available at any time, but prophylactic antiviral therapy directed at other viral infections should be continued according to standard clinical guidelines and institutional practices, so Tamiflu seems not to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19. Do we have data from Italy or China about the risk of COVID-19 infection in temporary neutropenic patients? 
Is the risk increased for our patients that go through period of five or 10 days of neutropenia between sites or chemo? At this time, there is only one published detailed report comparing COVID-19 course of illness in patients with cancer to those without cancer. Uh, and as you can see, this was a Lancet Oncology paper. You can find it there. This paper reports on a prospective cohort of more than 1,500 patients with COVID-19, 18 of which had a prior history of cancer, and found that patients with a history of cancer had a higher incidence of severe events, defined as the percentage of patients admitted to an intensive care unit requiring invasive ventilation or death compared to other patients. It did not establish a definite increase in incidence of COVID-19 infection in this population, but only high, high risk of ICU and death. In correspondence related to this report, CIA and colleagues also in Lancet of Court stated that these 18 patients represent a heterogeneous group and are not an ideal representation of the entire population of patients with cancer. You can understand that we have very limited uh, data on that. So in order to conclude, I think that we have to reduce the hospital visit for our patients in order to balance efficacy and safety, use more oral drugs if possible, postpone autologous transplant in standard risk patients, maintenance with oral drugs like lenalidomide can be continued. In case of COVID-19 infection, fo follow the local guidelines, for example, increase the use of chloroquine and uh, uh, azathioprine is, uh, sorry, and uh, azithromycin is uh, recommended uh, before the patient is admitted to the hospital and then into the hospital, the use of remdesivir in a clinical trial is also used, or tocilizumab in patients who are having ARDS. Unfortunately, there is no data regarding COVID-19 in myeloma patients today. There is only one published patient in the literature. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to have questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Prof. Terpos, for this uh, very excellent, comprehensive uh, overview for uh, managing myeloma patients and for viewing uh, earlier uh, the ISMO guidelines. So we will go uh, for the Q&A session, and I would li like to request all panelists to be around, please. So um, we have some questions here. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Asiri. Uh, so, Mushabab, uh, how you handle, uh, you, you uh, mentioned uh, regarding the use of PPE and your recommendation from uh, the National Cancer Institute, and how to handle your patient uh, with the COVID-19? Uh, because there is a conflict regarding using just a surgical mask or uh, N95. Uh, what's, what is the recommendation, the actual recommendation? Depends whether the patient is confirmed uh, COVID-19 or not. The question is, he is COVID-19. If it's COVID, he should not receive anti-cancer treatment. No, the question for the use of PPE, uh, the protective, uh, uh, will you use the, the surgical mask or? Uh, no, 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 no. If it's, if it's confirmed, it should be the N95. So this is the recommendation of uh, yes. uh, Saudi cancer. Also, this is the recommendation of CDC, Saudi CDC. Uh, surgical mask for the patient who not confirmed. Okay. Uh, a question for Dr. Uh, Riyad Dada. Uh, uh, what is uh, your uh, opinion regarding the theory that says that um, uh, Felkerstein uh, could increase the respiratory to toxicity for uh, patient? Uh, because we mentioned we, we want to offer patient uh, supportive GCSF to reduce the immune suppressive uh, period and uh, there is a theory that said it might increase the respiratory effect. Dr. Dada, the question of Dr. Dada to Dr. Dada. Dr. Dada, you are around? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm around. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Um, the theory is remaining a theory. So I have read such reports. It has not been confirmed uh, in, uh, in a re re reliable way and in clinical trials, uh, and the risk is overweighing the, uh, I mean, the, the benefit is overweighing the risk for using GCSF. If you use GCSF, the patient will not be 
exposed at risk of uh, neutropenia like other patients, and we, he will not be at risk to come to the hospital and get the risk of infected on the way or in, in the hospital. Therefore, and it, it was actually discussed uh, in one of the um, uh, society's recommendations, uh, what about GCF and increasing the, the risk of lung toxicity in the era of COVID-19 and the recommendation from uh, the, the uh, society is to go ahead and give uh, GCSF. Okay, uh, question to Prof. Terpos. Uh, maybe you mentioned just if you highlight again, uh, what's your preferred induction uh, for a patient with newly diagnosed myeloma? Okay, if the patient is eligible for transplant and has a standard risk cytogenetics or even with high risk cytogenetics, I will go for VRD now. And uh, after one or two cycles of VRD, I may go for Velicate weekly if the patient achieves a good response. The problem is with the transplant and for the high risk, as I mentioned, our standard practice is to, to do the transplant, to do the autologous transplant and not to postpone that. Uh, we try to um, isolate our patients uh, as much as possible uh, and um, as you understand, um, uh, we have to have a negative uh, COVID-19 uh, test at least once before the transplant, a few days before the transplant, we try to, uh, uh, to uh, have another, another one just on the day of admission in the hospital. Um, in Greece, we were very fortunate, and I think this is the same in Saudi Arabia, that we had uh, measures very, very early. So compared to the other European countries, we have very, very low number of uh, patients and deaths. Probably the deaths is the most uh, uh, important issue, because if you don't do a lot of tests, you are not going to find uh, the, the patients. But we have only 120 deaths to date. Just to let you know that compared to Belgium, that has exactly the same population, Belgium has more than 2,500 uh, deaths. So we are ve very good. So that's why we have also suggested not to postpone the transplant in high-risk patients due to the very low uh, infection rate. Uh, the R0, as they call it, are, uh, is 0 0.6 in, in Greece, suggesting that one patient can infect only 0 0.6 other patients, uh, which is very low. That's why we don't postpone the transplant. Uh, to be honest, I don't know if I was in Belgium, for example, that compared to the population, it is uh, much higher than Italy, I can tell you. Uh, uh, I don't know if I would go for the same direction. Probably I would postpone some of the transplants in cases of very good responses. But regarding induction, I would go for VRT. For the non-eligible for transplant, if I had a standard risk patient, I would go for Lendex, definitely. I will not go for VRD from, uh, for, for this patient uh, in order to avoid the hospital visits. And of course, if I had high risk disease, I would go for VRD. Okay. I will try to avoid daratumumab in general. We don't know exactly uh, what the, um, uh, the effect of daratumumab will be in uh, our patients uh, in case of COVID-19 infection because due to lymphopenia that we see, and lymphopenia is a very, very bad prognostic feature for the COVID patients, as we've seen in several trials also in our patients, it was exactly the same. If a patient comes with severe lymphopenia, for example, uh, then the probability of going to ICU is uh, multiplied. And for this reason, I would not prefer to have daratoma till having strong evidence that this drug is not uh, uh, bad for the patients. Uh, yes, you answered some of them because um, there is a question regarding the patient who was already on DARA maintenance. So, will you so for, for the DARA tumor, I think once per month, if someone is um, on maintenance, depending on the uh, phase of maintenance. So, if we talk about first line, uh, frontline patients who were eligible for trial, received the transplant and received DARA LEN, for example, because this is the national guideline. Uh, then I would stop DARA to be honest. For DARA RD patients who have started on DARA RD, non eligible for transplant according to the license of the drug, um, depending on the risk. If the patient is standard risk, I would avoid DARA to If the patient is high risk, I will continue with DARA a little bit monthly. DARA monthly. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, one question to Dr. Dada, uh, your opinion regarding uh, uh, omitting uh, pleomycin from the first cycle of induction? So pleomycin is the least needed, uh, according to recent research, uh, the least needed uh, chemotherapy and EBVD, but still it is unfortunately needed. We know earlier trials from the Germans, we tried to omit pleomycin at the data were inferior. Um, uh, but we have, meanwhile, a, con a more uh, convenient drug, which is brentuximab bilotin with, least, uh, with, with uh, uh, less side effects. And we have clinical data supporting that in, in, in patients with advanced stages. So I will be replacing bleomycin in advanced stages uh, by brentuximab bilotin. Okay, and uh, one more question is um, how, you were, uh, how you will manage a patient with positive and trumpet uh, who need escalation, will you uh, how you will escalate? Will you use brentuximab or your wave uh, uh, Exactly, as we ha we don't have until now data to uh, support this theory that uh, escalation with brentuximab will uh, uh, be uh, superior to uh, uh, BCOP uh, escalation, but I mean. Uh, we don't have many data in this era of COVID-19. So we have uh, to uh, go uh, new paths, and uh, I, I would uh, use and add uh, um, brentuximab bedotin in those patients who have a positive PET scan after the second cycle, but in well-responding patients, of course. The patient are responding, but they have uh, residual activity. I will take bleomycin and uh, uh, but instead, uh, And um, so, uh, one more question: Is your uh, preferred regimen in relapse uh, setting these days in the era of COVID-19? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, we have, uh, luckily, in Hodgkin lymphoma, we have many uh, uh, approaches for the selfish treatment. I cannot count all of them: cisplatin combinations, gymsar combinations. Um, and we have more recently brentuximab uh, vidotin plus bendamustin, but we know the hematotoxicity is high. This is one of the preferred regimen, but in the era of COVID-19, I would uh, use rather the uh, GV, uh, GVD as a gymsar-based chemotherapy. Uh, well, thank you. Dr. Asiri, uh, uh, is there any plan from uh, National Cancer Institutes uh, for the support of uh, supply for medication in the peripheral centers who are the, now adapting to uh, a company or accept uh, the patient from the central region because there is a shortage of medication in the periphery. Is there a plan for compensate for that? And this including uh, the direct purchase of non-fulmorally drugs. Do you have idea about that? The, the affirmative medication is, 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 is uh, it is, a big problem in the country. And also we, we, we're working now with the Saudi FDA for the essential medication and cancer care and biosimilars because sometimes you have difficulty to bring uh, uh, medication, you have uh, looked down, you, there is no uh, shipment. Uh, maybe you need to get some medication not registered by the Saudi FDA. Uh, for th this is uh, Corona give us a chance to, to look back and, and find solution for, for, for these issues. Uh, Saudi health cancer has nothing to do with, with, with purchasing. Uh, it, is, it is related to uh, regulation and uh, standards. Uh, but the program and the, and the ministry, they're working hard to, to make access uh, to the, uh, the major medication store in Riyadh uh, and the patient to get their medication directly from, from the ministry. Uh, some centers, they, they already have some relation with, with the outreach uh, clinics or centers to send them the medication through the DHL. Uh, again, there is there is problem in the shortage, not only for medication, also for the imaging. I think the PET scan is almost completely is not used nowadays because the radio pharmaceutical is not available. So even the decision making process affected because of not availability and non-availability of, of some imaging procedures. So uh, I think maybe after this disaster go, we may sit down and look back and find what the what the uh, 
thing that we get out of it and, and, and make it, uh, the future better. Uh, uh, one more question for, uh, for you as a radiation oncologist. What's your uh, opinion regarding the use of radiation uh, radiotherapy in uh, early stage uh, Hodgkin lymphoma these days during the COVID? If you got a consultation for such patient, will you recommend or will you? Radiation is, is, is important for, for Hodgkin, but it's not the cornerstone. Uh, it, it, the cornerstone remains is, 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 uh, chemotherapy. Uh, but if there is problem, sometimes I'd like to call for the, for the worst. If there is no non availability of, of medication, which is not the case, inshallah, uh, then I, th I think it is, ca can be an alternative. But why the chemotherapy is available? Full chemotherapy, uh, uh, I think the standard of, of, of care should be remain as the same as, uh, as in the past. We should not jeopardize the patient's care for the risk, which not maybe uh, maybe is not there. There's maybe theoretical risk so far. And even the number of cancer patients who have uh, the COVID and cancer, I think it's small. In our hospital in King Fahad, we have only one case so far since the problem started. So. Uh, we should not jeopardize the patient care for just a theoretical uh, risk. Uh, can, may I add yeah, some uh, comment? Yeah. Dr. Rama? Yes, please. Yeah, before that, I mean, we, we uh, with regard to the salvage treatment, uh, uh, so another option, what I forgot to say is uh, single agent pernotuximab, and nivolumab or bimbolizumab, these are very attractive if they are available uh, at your hospital. So with regard to the radiation, the, the, the problem with radiation, of course, radiation is not as immunosuppressive as chemotherapy. The only problem what the authors from the ASH, from the ASCO and different societies are saying, curative radiation is associated with very frequent traveling. The patient has to travel to the hospital, to the facility several times. And radiation, curative radiation is going over several weeks. And these travels, they are putting the patient at risk to get infected, not the radiation itself. The, the, uh, 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 the travel from home to the hospital and staying at the hospital, this is the problem. That's why we shall look in, in, in patient with Hodgkin lymphoma to complete with chemotherapy rather than uh, uh, putting them at this risk. Thank you. Uh, if I was to say something about that, mainly for in the myeloma setting, we use uh, radiotherapy in several cases, but uh, it is the major treatment for solitary plasmocytoma. So we are writing now the European Myeloma Network recommendations or, uh, or a consensus pa panel. Uh, opinion because it cannot be a recommendation, we have no data on that, but for solitary plasmocytoma we will continue to suggest that radiotherapy has to remain the standard of care and has to be uh, given to the patients because uh, as uh, Dr. Alassiri mentioned, uh, I believe that it is important to treat the patients and uh, uh, of course if they are in an unlucky position to have a COVID infection that may create a lot of problems for their health, we have not to generalize this for the patients who need radiotherapy for the treatment of their disease. Okay, question to Dr. Uh, Prof. Terpus. Uh, uh, there are some new myeloma agents might be beneficial in treating COVID-19. What's your uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, I believe that uh, uh, the doctor who, I'm, who questioned this uh, talks about thalidomide, that there were some data on thalidomide, but also there are some data on uh, uh, other drugs that we use in CLL and in uh, uh, Waldstorff macroglobulinemia that have to do with uh, the brutinib kinase inhibitors, like ibrutinib or mainly acalabrutinib, but there is a small report uh, with these agents. So uh, the COVID virus, uh, biology includes some of these pathways after the uh, uh, virus uh, uh, adherence to the AC2, uh, AC2 receptor. And um, I do know that there are studies, if you go to the midline, to the clinical trial goal, you can see a lot of studies with these agents like thalidomide, uh, acalabrutinib, or even ibrutinib for the treatment of COVID-19 infection. We don't have any data yet. Uh, only some uh, case reports. I don't think that we have to uh, generalize, uh, but we may have some uh, good uh, uh, treatment uh, 
because of this data, mainly of these agents, mainly with thalidomide that is an anti-inflammatory drug also. It may uh, help some of the patients. But if you want my uh, experience for the COVID-19 uh, unit that we have in our hospital, is that the use uh, in the severe disease in the ICU unit, if you want to use an anti-inflammatory drug, I think that tocilizumab seems to be the most effective. Uh, one more question, Prof. Um, uh, your opinion regarding reducing the dose of linalidomide upfront induction in, in the era of COVID? Um, as I mentioned, uh, regarding neutropenia, we don't have uh, any data that patients who uh, have neutropenia, not lymphopenia, but neutropenia, are more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. And this comes from several uh, data from different countries. So at least from the beginning, I would not uh, recommend to reduce the dose of linalidomide. But then if we talk about maintenance, either after uh, for patients who are eligible for transplant, after transplant for the high risk, or for patients who have received six or nine cycles and have a very good response, for the elderly I mean, then I would uh, take into consideration the reduction of the dose. But um, for the majority of the patient, this is not the case. Um, your opinion regarding patients who are requesting, uh, who are already on Velcade maintenance and uh, interested to switch to uh, Revlimid uh, during the COVID area and go back to Velcade back. So you, will you consider uh, changing some people? So the patient has received only Velcade maintenance, if I understood correctly. Um, although we don't have data on that, I can tell you that in many American centers, they uh, change it to Exazo not to, to rev limit, or uh, I mean um, the, the alternative is, and you have some data that exazomib is better than placebo, so in order to stop, for example, probably the substitution with exazomib may give you good results, and this is what it is uh, done in many, many centers in the U.S., and also there are centers in the U.S. that in the relapse factory setting that they use KRT, for example, after the good response with KRT, they change to IRT. And maybe the last question, uh, the duration of Zometa post-transplant, how long you recommend to continue? What's your recommendation? Okay. If the patient has achieved the VGPR or complete response, then I stop it after 12 months, monthly. Now with the COVID infection, I may give it for every three months for a two-year duration. Okay, uh, I think we come to the end. Uh, I would like uh, to thank all the panelists and all our uh, speakers, our uh, guest participants for uh, sharing this uh, webinar. And um, I, I think it will, uh, hopefully it will be beneficial for everybody. And um, special thank for Takeda for sponsoring this webinar. And uh, hope uh, for everybody Ramadan Mubarak and stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Bye. Bye.